live just up these stairs to the concourse area in the Los Angeles Convention Center, where today as a luncheon speakers, we're going to have be hearing from Bill O'Reilly, who you just met here, also Al Franken and Molly Ivins. All three of them are going to be speaking, and the uh, moderator for this event is uh, former Congresswoman Patricia Schroeder. She's just come to the podium. I'm Pat Schroeder from the Association of American Publishers, and I can't tell you how excited I am about this afternoon program. I don't think there's any chance your lunch is going to get cold. I think we're going to have some nice fire up here, and it's going to be a lot of fun. First of all, I have to apologize because uh, Tucker Carlson had a family emergency, and he will not be up here. Therefore, I am smiling because this is Pat Schroeder's view of fair and balanced. Oh, sorry. Um, I also want to say that we have a very distinguished person in the audience today, one of my dear beloved former colleagues who is out carrying the torch 24-7 and all of us have to make sure that this works. And that is Congressman Bernie Sanders from Vermont. Stand up, Bernie. I see so many of you out there that are friends and publishers and booksellers, and I think this is a wonderful event where we all get together. But let me get out of the way because we got some really marvelous folks today. First of all, I'm supposed to stand up here and be objective about Molly Ivins, and there is no way in the world I can do that. This is one of the world's great treasures, and I just am so, and she, yeah, there's no other word for it. She makes the sisterhood proud, you know? She's got a column in you know, over 300 newspapers where she tries to set everything straight. For some reason, she is able to remain cheerful in this political environment. Um, this wonderful native of Houston went to Smith College. She got her master's from Columbia University School of Journalism, and now, here is a little secret that I don't know if I should say or not in the, in the climate we're in. She went to the Institute of Political Science in Paris. Oh. <laughs> yes, where she studied freedom, I think. Um, anyway, she then went to work for the Houston Chronicle and had this first great job where she worked her way up to being sewer editor, and obviously that naturally got her right into politics. She found her course, and she has been there ever since. We all know the many, many, many of the wonderful newspapers she's been with, the Minneapolis Tribune, um, the New York Times, the Dallas Times Herald, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, the uh, Texas Observer. We could go on and on. Some of the most distinguished journalistic uh, instruments we have in this country. She's gone on to write books that we've all been very proud of. She's won all sorts of awards, and I could give you all of those. But I really think what we're here today is about this new book that's coming out. And believe me, I have made a pledge to make sure I live through fall, because this book is going to make my fall very much worthwhile. Molly is here today because with Random House, they are coming out with a great new book in the fall called Bushwhacked. Living with George W. Bush in America. Um, I don't think anybody has had more experience than a Texan who has covered him from day one. And I am just going to get out of the way and turn this over to my heroine, Molly Ivins. Molly. <laughs> thank you. I uh, thank you all. I know many of you uh, were there at the awards last night and uh, heard me speak, and I apologize if there's any overlap. Um, I want to tell you another great reason to prefer independent booksellers. Uh, right after Shrub came out, I was in Massachusetts, and the husband of a friend of mine came up to me and said, Molly, I knew that I would be seeing you this weekend. So a week ago, I went to buy your book at the Barnes & Noble in Boston. and." Uh, I looked where I thought it would be in new nonfiction, and then I tried the politics section, and it wasn't there, so I went to the information counter and said, y'all have Shrub by Molly Avenues. And the lady said, oh, yes, after she looked it up, and very proudly led me to the gardening section. <laughs> All right. Um, 
The publisher wants me to talk about the new book, and uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, we were tempted to start the new book uh, by saying in the introduction, if y'all had read the first one, I wouldn't have had to write this one. Um, and I must say, I, I think the predictive value of Shrub at this point, which as you know, was based entirely on Bush's record, uh, not on any personal characteristics. Um, was very strong in its predictive value. The one area, of course, where we, we were not able to be helpful was uh, the foreign direction of foreign policy. Um, Shrub wound up being quoted on the floor of Congress uh, during the run-up to the political debate because the only stab at it uh, we could make it, uh, in that field was observed. Uh, you know, I've known Bush since high school. I didn't know him well, let me point out, but I have known him an awfully long time. And he does have a macho competitive streak that is, tends to be touched off by uh, very strong uh, sort of testosterone poisoned males, if I may put it that way. Uh, and uh, we just made note of this in Shrub and said in passing, somebody should probably be worrying about this in terms of you know, a future, his future encounters with some Saddam Hussein. Um, a moment of prescience, of course, which we can now brag about. Okay, the new book, as I mentioned last night, is based on an old premise that Jim Hightower and I came up with, which is that the media in this country pay far too much attention to the Dow Jones average. And what we really need is the Doug Jones average. Doug Jones, average American. And uh, how's old Doug doing? Is he up? Is he down? How's it going for Doug? And I think, you know, we should have a daily report on that. Uh, so what Lou and I did, Lou DeBose, my writing partner, um, in every chapter we start with some change in policy that's been made by the Bush administration, and then we trace it out and see how it affects real people in their everyday lives. And uh, this is an idea so old that it's new again. Uh, people look at it in astonishment. Now, it used to be what political reporting was about, how the government affects your life. Uh, but somehow we've gotten away from that, and there's this terrible disconnect between Washington and the rest of the country. And many of our fellow citizens just don't see uh, how government is shaping their lives. They're indifferent to it. They think it doesn't have anything to do with them. They're under the impression that it's all them. It's those people. It's those people in Washington, it's those people in Austin, that they don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and as you know, it's um, one of my theories of life is that uh, not only is government us, we own it, you, me, all of us, um, and we run it, we're the board of directors, those people work for us. Uh, and so um, we went around the country having various adventures on, uh, and meeting fabulous people. Um, I told last night the story of uh, the women in uh, the Delta Pride Catfish Factory in Belzoni, Mississippi. Uh, these women do 12 catfish a minute. Uh, and uh, their hands look like they've got rheumatoid arthritis. They've got these big things called gangliatic cysts on top from repetitive stress. and. Uh, they had never heard of the people in Washington who killed off ergonomic regulations. They had no idea who Eugene Scalia was or that he'd been a lobbyist uh, for the trade association opposed to ergonomic regulations before Bush appointed him to be the top lawyer at the Labor Department. Uh, and when, they, when we told them about it, of course, their reaction was, uh, classically, we were prepared to, you know, play the dirge and say, oh, these poor, pitiful victims of bad policy and all that. But the thing about Americans is that they are sassy and funny and irreverent and you cannot keep them down. And uh, we told these ladies about uh, what had happened on the ergonomics regulation, and they would say things like, he said that'd be junk science? Well, you tell him I want his ass next to me on the cut and gut line, I will show him junk science. I mean, they were fabulous. Uh, and everywhere we went, we met the most extraordinary and feisty Americans. Uh, there's a rancher out in western Wyoming. Uh, he's a, sort of straight out of a Marlboro poster. Um, he looks like a Marlboro cowboy. He ranches like a Marlboro cowboy. He's the real thing. And um, one day, his, his uh, ranch is watered by a stream, which, of course, water being scarce in that part of the country, uh, he has carefully worked over the years to put in berms to take advantage of every single drop that comes through. 
And suddenly his water turned poisonous and started killing his grass. So of course he had to cut back on his herd and he's been severely damaged and he may not, he wants to pass that ranch on to his son, but he may not be able to do so. So he goes to the government for help with this problem and uh, the guy in question, his name J. Stephen Griles. He's the number two man at Interior. The problem is that upstream from this ranch, coal bay methane operators are putting in wells to get out methane gas. And what happens in the course of doing that is they put in water, the water picks up salinity and poisons the rivers and the creeks. Um, J. Stephen Griles, uh, to whom our man tried to go with his complaint, uh, was formerly the lobbyist for the Coal Bed Methane Operators Association, uh, and not exactly sympathetic to the rancher's point of view. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we found again and again. Um, this rancher uh, was a member of the National Rifle Association. He was former chairman of the County Republican Party. He was just as staunch a Republican as you could wish. Uh, and he has joined an environmental group uh, out there because he cannot get any relief or any help from his own government. Um, he's tried um, suing them, and um, basically, as he says, he's paying for the, his lawyer to sue the government, and he's paying for the government's lawyer through his taxes, and he, doesn't, he can't quite figure out how he got himself into this mess because he didn't do anything to anybody. Um, the further part on the Grouse chapter is that uh, Grouse uh, tried to kill off an EPA report on the proposed overall methane operator's plant. Uh, which said that the thing was El Stenko and would kill both the main rivers that provide all the water in northwestern Wyoming. Uh, Grouse tried to have that one buried. Um, everywhere we went, we found people who were really heroes. Um, we were looking into the result of the decision on Superfund. The Bush administration will not uh, push to reinstate the tax on chemical companies that pays for Superfund toxic site cleanups. And I've always said uh, Bush's chemical dependency problem has nothing to do with cocaine. It has to do with Dow and Monsanto. Uh, they were the forces that put him in office down in Texas. Um, the trouble with, there's now no money left in the Superfund. Uh, they cut off the tax that paid for cleaning up orphan sites. But it's more than that. It's not just that the orphan sites, those abandoned with no, what they call legally responsible parties, um, can't get cleaned up. The way the government has gotten chemical companies and other polluters to clean up toxic waste sites is by saying either you do it or we'll do it and charge you three times as much as it costs us. Well, now there's no money in the Superfund site. They can't go ahead and clean up these sites where there are responsible parties and then find them for the cost. And as a result, all the cleanup has stopped. Uh, we met a fellow who got interested in this problem in Edison, New Jersey. Uh, one day, he's a caterer, pastry chef. And one of his friends said to him, you want to see some green rabbits? And uh, he went out and by God, there were green bunny rabbits hopping around. And uh, one of the all time worst uh, fly by night, uh, sleazy uh, chemical operators of all time had left huge pits uh, containing everything from Agent Orange to something called Dinoseb. I mean, you've never heard such a nightmare of toxic chemicals in your life. And this dinoseb actually turns bunnies green. Um, and so this guy got really interested in the question. He was thinking, well, if it turns rabbits green, what the hell is it doing to the kids around here? Um, and they finally got it declared a toxic waste site. Um, and they got it on the Superfund list. But of course, that's now that great victory, which took them almost 10 years of citizen active and action. I mean, the, in the best tradition. Uh, talking to state bureaucrats, getting government off its ass, getting them up there to investigate what all this stuff was. Um, it took 10 years, and then, of course, whammo. They were on the list, but the fund ran out of money. Um, the, again and again, we're finding this pattern. Um, it's particularly 
keen in the environmental area, but in the few chapters where we address not individual uh, lives and what is being done to them, but um, the larger uh, context of what's happened to old Doug Jones, um, the numbers are not looking good at any level. Um, the number of people losing pensions, losing health care, uh, keeps going up. The uh, so-called pension reform program uh, put up by the administration is going to adversely affect millions of older workers. Um, the list goes on and on, and uh, the bottom line is that old Doug Jones is getting screwed. And I've always thought that the only questions in government are who's getting screwed and who's doing the screwing. Uh, Benito Mussolini once said that fascism should more properly be called corporatism because it is the merger of corporate and government power. Now, I don't know if what we're looking at is fascism, uh, but I'm telling you, we spent a year and a half researching this book, and old Doug Jones is not doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And our next uh, author this morning, or this afternoon, is Bill O'Reilly, who I'm sure all of you know. Yeah, see? They're all here for you. It's very clear he is the host of one of the most watched talk news shows on cable television. And he's had a tremendous, long, long-standing career in television before he is now currently on Fox News Channel, The O'Reilly Factor. But he was at ABC. Uh, for many years where he uh, was an inside edition. He's won two Emmy Awards. And we in the book selling and in book publishing are very happy because he's had two top of the list books recently. They're absolutely wonderful. Number one on the uh, New York Times. The O'Reilly Factor was one and No Spin Zone was number two. And guess what? Come September, he's ready to come out with a new one. And his new book's going to be called, Who's Looking Out for You? It's published by Broadway Books, uh, his publisher, and it's going to be looking at all the problems post 9-11 and what is really going to be happening or what has been happening. So he may have a little bit different perspective on uh, Doug Jones, and I'm going to be very interested to hear what you have to say. Bill, Bill the microphone's yours. Go for it. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Who's Looking Out for You is a very personal book. It's not a political book. I don't write political books. My first two were, uh, the first one was uh, The O'Reilly Factor basically was a uh, primer on um, how I arrived at my philosophy of life. And then The No Spin Zone was the combat that I went through uh, on the uh, Factor television program with the major news makers in America. And uh, this book, uh, who's Looking Out for You is a personal book um, about you. Now, I don't know you, but I know about you. And uh, I take on uh, all of the uh, powers in the country in a non-ideological way, in the sense that I feel that ideology is harmful to you. I don't feel that people pushing political agendas and philosophies does you any good at all. I think that you should arrive at your own conclusions based upon facts and analysis. Um, I'm not like Rush Limbaugh who wants to convert you to his way of thinking and if you don't feel the way he, that he does, then he'll denigrate you uh, or call, you know, put you in a category. I don't do that. I basically go out there and I'm a problem solver and I say, here's the problem, here's the situation, here's how I would deal with it, here's how they are dealing with it, are they looking out for you or not? Therefore, we can get a lot of different areas. Um, I get into uh, the horrible situation that we have in a criminal justice system where uh, the rich win and uh, truth doesn't matter at all because the lawyers aren't required to tell the truth. In the David Westerfield, Daniel Van Dam case right down I-5 in uh, San Diego, the best. those lawyers lied. They, they flat li out lied in the courtroom and nobody did anything about it, costing the state of California millions of dollars. And 
the guy got convicted ultimately, but uh, when we interviewed the jurors after the trial, they bought this crazy scenario that uh, the Van Damme uh, friends might have done it. They were considering that very seriously when these lawyers knew that their client killed the seven-year-old girl because they offered a deal before the trial started to lead the police to the body. All right, and we filed a formal complaint with the California Bar Association, which of course will not do anything because it's a big clubhouse. So those are the kinds of things that I get into. Um, now, I do take on the, uh, the uh, demagogues in uh, the United States, but I don't call anybody a liar. I'm not uh, doing that. I'm not uh, <laughs> calling anybody big fat. I'm not doing that. I'm not too big on that kind of stuff, you know? I'm trying to elevate the discourse here. <laughs> All right. Now, let me give you an example of ideology gone mad. Um, the weapons of mass destruction, which is, uh, I think, the most important story right now in play for everybody in the United States. On the right, you have the uh, lockstep people going, well, Saddam Hussein was his own weapon of mass destruction. That's the right spin. Okay? And, you know, these spin talking points come out every morning, both on the right and the left. I don't get them. I'm sure Al does, but I don't. Um, and uh, then they, they, it becomes a mantra. All right? So they'll call up the talk shows, and I go, doesn't matter. We haven't found the anthrax. Saddam Hussein was his own weapon of mass destruction. Well, that's a bunch of garbage. It's nonsense. Okay? If we don't have intelligence agencies here who can ascertain who has what, then we're in trouble. And if those people gave false intelligence to uh, the Pentagon and the president, then those people got to be fired, flat out. They're gone. No excuses. Okay, now we got Colin Powell screaming today. He saw the intelligence with his own eyes. All right, fine. Then you're going to have to explain it a little bit further. But unlike some other ideologues, I am not going to condemn anybody. I'm not going to say there was a conspiracy. I'm not going to do those connected dots because I don't think that's legitimate. All right, I'm going to demand an explanation, but I'm willing to hear the explanation. And here's what else separates me from ideologues, both on the right and the left. I want the United States to find the weapons of mass destruction. I want them to find it because that's what's best for our country, not what's best for Bush, what's best for the United States. Because if they don't find them, we lose credibility throughout the world. And the people who hate us have more argument to hate us. All right? So I want them to find those weapons. And I make that quite clear, not to push any ideology. I couldn't care less who the president, next president is. It doesn't matter to me. All right? And I back that up all day long. You know, I can't get people to come on and factor from the Bush administration. All right, come on. Way too tough a venue. Call Jeb Bush. Find out what he thinks about me. So those people who try to, you know, on both the right and the left, and the left weapons of mass destruction is complete hysteria. It isn't there. They made it up. Well, how do they know it isn't there? Maybe they'll find it. You know, how do they know? Robert Shear knows. He doesn't know anything. He... Now, when you get blinded by your ideology, as many of Americans are, you can't think straight because what you're trying to do is you're trying to find facts to fit your hypothesis. Okay? That doesn't help you out. You've got to look at it tough and hard, what the truth is, how you arrive at the conclusions. Now, I'm an analyst, all right? And when I say something, I back it up. Now, um, if I'm going to be accused of being a liar, now you better have something there. Because in six and a half years on the O'Reilly Factor and one year on the radio, two hours a day, five days a week, I have not had to retract one story, not one. Of course, we've made mistakes factual mistakes, and we correct them, as every newspaper does every day. You'll see the correction column. But we have not had to retract one story, because we are very methodical in the way we go about our presentation. Now, who's looking out for you also? I think, whether you like me or not, you'll love this chapter. I tell you all the mistakes that I make in very vivid detail, so you don't make them, all right? Because I live in a very competitive, brutal world, and I... I gave my uh, detractors more than enough rope to hurt me, and it did hurt me. And I tell you, here's what I did. But the basic theme of the book is chaos breeds more chaos, and the clear-thinking people and disciplined people will have a happy life. And if you're not disciplined, 
You won't. And the government can't make you have a happy life. The fallacy on the left is that they believe all of these money and these programs and everything are going to lift people up. Well, they're not. What lifts people up is discipline, is sobriety, is principles, is hard work. It has nothing to do with the government. Now, the government can provide a safety net and should. But if you think that you're going to solve social problems by pumping gazillions of dollars in there, you're crazy. You're not. It's personal behavior that matters in this country. That is what makes people successful. Personal behavior, not governmental behavior. So we get into that in the book and in no uncertain terms. And then I run down to politicians, all of them, and I say, is this guy looking out for you? And you know what? One man can look out for you on one end and not look out for you on the other. It isn't black or white. It isn't all or nothing. John F. Kennedy's the best example of that. And Bill Clinton is an example of that, too. He did some very good things in office, things that I supported and applauded. But he did some very bad things, too. And I'm sure we'll find out the same about Bush when the truth comes to the fore about his policies. So Who's Looking Out for You is basically a book for you, not for me. All right, and I use my 30 years of journalistic experience to lay it out as best I can. And I'm real tough on myself, and I'm real tough on some other people who I feel are uh, not looking out for you. We name names, of course. We have a lot of fun. We name names. We don't call names. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Bill. And our last presenter this afternoon is Al Franken. And uh, I have absolutely no idea what I can say about Al Franken that he hasn't said about himself. <laughs> so I'm standing up here thinking, ah, 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 what do I say? Um, I think we all first ran across him when he started with Saturday Night Live as a writer. And, of course, he's gone on and written some absolutely wonderful things, including, but most people don't know, he was one of the co-writers of When a Man Loves a Woman. So he's been able to do a whole range of things. But we know him for his wonderful comedy. He's won five Emmys, which is amazing. And really, I think, something to be applauded. <laughs> He started as a political commentator with CNN, and of course my very favorite was the 1996 uh, commentating that he did with Arianne Huffington, The Strange Bedfellows. If any of you remember that, it really brought television to a new level. <laughs> it was really brought pillow talk, uh, a whole new thing. Um, Al has had some amazing books and big bestsellers. One was and I did like this one. Rush Limbaugh is a big fat idiot. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, sorry. And he's gone on to do several other books that we all know and love. But this fall, there is a new one coming out by Dutton. His publisher is Dutton, and he is coming forward with a book called Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them. A fair and balanced view of the right. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Franken. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Here's, uh, here's the, the preliminary cover uh, of Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them a Fair and Balanced Look at the Right. And uh, Bill, we talked about this before, the, the picture of you, if we can get one from the factory, would be great. Because uh, he wasn't, wasn't happy with this one. And, uh, you know, this is a public domain picture. And just any picture of you with your mouth open would be good. Um, we were asked what inspired us about, uh, to write this book. Uh, actually, God um, <laughs> uh, asked me to write this book um, uh, because he was so pissed off at, uh, at Bush, who claimed, uh, whose friends claimed that uh, he had been chosen by God, and God said, actually, he hadn't. Um, <laughs> 
and this is chosen by Clarence Thomas. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it was an interesting process with this book. Uh, I was asked to be a fellow at the Kennedy School, where you're a graduate, and uh, they at the Shorenstein Center, and they asked me to be a fellow there. I said, what do I have to do? And they said, nothing. Uh, but r write something, and it, <clears throat> I said, well, you don't want me to teach anything? I said, well, you can have a study group and, and teach something there. So I, I had a, a study group of 14 great kids from the Kennedy School and, and undergraduates, and I uh, taught them uh, to research my book. Um, um, basically, the book starts as a response to Bernie Goldberg and Ann Coulter about this supposed, this myth of a liberal bias in the media. And kind of the premise of, of the whole book, uh, the start of the book, is that asking whether there's a liberal or conservative bias in the mainstream media is like asking if the problem with Al-Qaeda is that they use too much oil in their hummus. <laughs> the problem with Al-Qaeda is they want to kill us. The biases of the mainstream media are far, are, there are many, many biases in sensationalism, horse race, get it first, do it cheap. Uh, there's just so many more important biases. And the idea that there's a liberal bias in the media that uh, is, is, is just ridiculous. All you have to do is like look at the coverage of Clinton. I mean, especially during the Monica thing, it was 24 7 Monica. And there were some news organizations that, that, that did not succumb to that temptation. I like to cite them wherever I go. Uh, Sailing Magazine. <laughs> um, American Grocer Monthly. Uh, Jugs. And uh, Big Butt. Which is ironic, because I thought Big Butt, you know, had a story. <laughs> and then if you look at the 2000 campaign, the, the idea that there was a bias on behalf of Gore is ridiculous. Remember in the, uh, uh, one of the uh, debates, uh, Gore said that he had gone to uh, Texas to go to a uh, disaster with James Lee Witt, the head of FEMA. It turned out he hadn't gone to that disaster with James Lee Witt. He went with a deputy of James Lee Witt. He went to 17 other disasters with James Lee Witt, not that one. Press jumps all over him. He's a liar. It was as if James Lee Witt was the most popular man in America and Gore was lying just to get some of that James Lee Witt magic, you know, to rub off on. Another one of the 2000 debates, Bush says this, and this is a quote. By far, the vast majority of my tax cut goes to those at the bottom. <laughs> By far, a vast majority of my tax cut goes to those at the bottom. Nothing from the press. Not a thing. And is it because they have a conservative bias? I don't think so. I think their attitude was, he doesn't know. <laughs> He doesn't know. Leave him alone. He doesn't know. <laughs> and so now we have this new tax cut, and every tax cut, of course, is going to the, the top, uh, people at the top, and Bill has supported all of those tax cuts. Um, and and they'll, they'll do great. Th first of all, on the economy. Let me talk a little, one thing about the economy. This is, I love statistics because they never lie. Numbers never lie. In the six years plus that the two Bushes have been president, there have been actually a negative net jobs. Not one new net job has been created. Extrapolating on that, if the Bushes had headed this country from the very beginning, our country's inception, to the present time, not one American would have ever worked. <laughs> Not one. 
So, you know, they do this uh, sometimes. They, they still say it, that the, it, oh, the bottom gets the biggest tax cut. Look, someone making $26,000 gets their taxes 100% tax cut. All their income taxes are, are cut by this, 100% tax cut. Well, of their income tax. And maybe they're paying $200 in income tax. And, oh, Dick Cheney, he's only getting an 8% cut. Gee, look, 100% cut for the waitress. And only an 8% cut for Dick Cheney, which is like a million dollars or half a million dollars, whatever it is. 100,000. 100,000. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Sometimes I overstate. Um, but, but this person making 26000 maybe a single mother, going to lose her Medicaid, going to lose her Medicaid for her kids, going to pay, is going to pay more than in state taxes, because their states are in terrible shape. Gonna, the kids are going to have, uh, there's going to be less money going into schools. Kentucky's releasing prisoners. I mean, this is, this is crazy what we're doing. And this huge, huge deficit. Remember, Bush said when we first went into deficit with him, he said, well, I said during the campaign, that, uh, you know, we don't, the only way we go into deficit is if we had a recession, a national emergency, or war. Well, I guess I hit the trifecta, right? Remember you said that? Except, you know what? He didn't say that during the campaign. Washington Post looked back, he never said it. One person did say it was Al Gore. Um, Bush, not great with language. Uh, evildoers, for example. Remember when he first started using evildoers? And every, the rest of the administration felt they had to use evildoers, too. It was really fun to watch, like, Dick Cheney have to slip in evildoers. It was like, um, uh, this is not a war against uh, Islam. Uh, this is an effort to eradicate the... Um, <laughs> evildoers. <laughs> So there's no, the mainstream media does not have a bias, left or right. There is, however, a right-wing media, and we know who they are. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal editorial page, talk radio, which you talked so eloquently about, Bill, uh, Fox, fair and balanced, uh, talk about Orwellian. I mean, come on. Um, and I, and I think they go back into, the, create an echo effect in the media. And as a result, I think the whole media has moved to the right. Now, I answer a couple of books, then that's part of the right-wing media too, and I know that you publishers are gonna start uh, publishing more right-wing books for you know, the bulk sales so that uh, Richard Mellon Scaife can you know, use Mona Charon's books for mulch. Um, but Ann Coulter's book, I take on, I write a chapter on Ann Coulter, and she brags about having 752 footnotes. And we, actually, she has no footnotes, she has end notes. <laughs> There's a difference, because you don't check the end notes. Especially, I think, her readers, or she at least depends on that. For example, let me quote from her book. After Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wrote an opinion contrary to the clearly expressed position of the New York Times editorial page, the Times responded with an editorial on Thomas titled The Youngest, Cruelest Justice. That was actually the headline on the lead editorial in the newspaper of record. Thomas is not engaged on the substance of his judicial philosophy. He is called a colored lawn jockey for conservative white interests, race trader, black snake, chicken and biscuit eating Uncle Tom, house negro and handkerchief head, Benedict Arnold and Judas Iscariot. All this from the tireless opponents of intolerance. Now what percentage of her readers think, do you think, think that the New York Times, from this uh, paragraph, called Clarence Thomas a chicken and biscuit eating Uncle Tom? I'll bet you like 99 percent. Well these aren't, this isn't from the New York Times. She endnotes them and then you have to go back and back and find, oh, I see, this was a Playboy interview with somebody. Or, oh, I see, this was an SCLC conference. She does this all the time. Also, she, 
I, I'm kind of an expert on it because in a New York Observer article, she called, she said that we were friendly. I, I had met her once, uh, and I guess I made the mistake of not just saying to her, you're horrible. I hate you. And And instead, I was cordial, so therefore I showed up as one of her friends. So in my book, I have a little thing. I say, even people Coulter consider friends, says she's a lying bitch, one. <laughs> a, horror of, a horror show of epic proportions, two, oh, the poor thing, and a bitch. And then the notes are on the bottom of the page, footnotes. Uh, one was me and my wife. Uh, two is I bid. <laughs> oh, the poor thing is my wife to me. <laughs> and uh, the fourth is to another friend. I, I, I don't want to run over my time, and I, and, uh, but the, the book is very wide ranging and gets into uh, a lot of things. And one of whom, and, and I know you don't like name calling, and I know that you say you retract everything, but I do, I do have Bill on the cover, and I want to just justify it, okay? Um, can I borrow your water? No. no? <laughs> Molly? Well, oh, you're out? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Taste it first. Yeah. Because <laughs> right. I really need to tell this right. Okay, and Bill, you know a little bit of this story. A couple years ago, I'm watching C-SPAN, which I love to watch. And I see Bill uh, promoting his book. No spin zone. And he's on, it's a, it's a format like this actually, it's a moderator with, just with him though. And he says, uh, the moderator says something like, um, uh, you hosted Inside Edition, which was a tabloid show. And Bill says, uh, tabloid show, we won two Peabody's. And the guy said, well, yeah, but it was, you gotta admit, it was kind of a tabloid show. And he goes, um, Peabody's only the most uh, <laughs> prestigious award in journalism, we won two of them. The guy says, well, yeah, but it had kind of a tabloidy uh, format. And he says, uh, you want us to give our two Peabody's back? So I'm watching this, and I'm going like, Inside Edition never won a Peabody. So I Nexus Peabody and Inside Edition. And I do get three hits, and they're all Bill saying on his show uh, that, the, that Inside Edition had won the Peabody. Here's uh, one from August 30th. I anchored a program called Inside Edition, which has won a Peabody Award. There it won one. Uh, May 8th, it got, you won two. Uh, well, all I've got to say is that Inside Edition has won, I believe, uh, you did qualify it, two Peabody Awards, the highest journalism award in the country. And then on May 19th, 2000, you go into this long thing about, um, someone says it's, uh, Neville says, um, he says, you hosted Inside Edition, you say, correct, which is considered a tabloid show, you say, by whom? By many people, does that mean, and even, and then you say, we throw the Peabody Awards back, we won Peabody Awards. So I go to the Peabody website and look for Inside Edition Peabody Awards, and there aren't any, and I call the Peabody people, and I said, did you guys give uh, Inside Edition a Peabody? And there was some laughter, and, uh, you know, because I'm thinking, what was it for, you know, how bear is too bear, or, you know, something on Madonna's first, you know, the father of her first baby, maybe you won it for. But they, they say, no, they've never won it. So I call uh, Bill, and you were really nice. You called me back. And uh, you said, uh, yeah, what is it, Al? And it was, it was very warm. And um, <laughs> I said, I saw you on C-SPAN. You said you won Inside Edition won two Peabody's. Well, we did. I said, well, you really should talk to the Peabody people about that, because they don't think you did. And he said, I'll call you back. So calls me back five minutes. You remember this? He says, uh, uh, okay, it was a poke. I say, a poke? He said, yeah. It's very, it's uh, just as prestigious as the Peabody. I said, so there are two most prestigious awards in journalism. He says, Al, it's very, very prestigious. I said, well, okay, don't you think it's odd that you got it wrong about a journalism award. <laughs> and he says, Al, if you want to go after me, go ahead. So I say, okay. So, <laughs> so I call the Washington Post. I call Lloyd Grove at the Washington Post. 
And I tell him the whole thing, and he calls, calls Bill, and Bill says, Al has a jihad against me or something, so I got to poke. Now, now, Bill, see, I had sort of expected Bill to go, gee, Al, thanks for pointing this out. Boy, is that embarrassing. Woo! Boy, I don't want to make that mistake again. No, but it was, go, uh, go ahead, go after me. So, um, Bill in the thing acknowledges making a mistake, so big deal. You go on your show and say big deal. About a few weeks later, a columnist from Newsday picks it up and says, writes a column called, Not All the Facts on the Factor of Facts, or something like that. And then you do a little special thing. You're out with Michael Wolf. And on attack journalism, it's your, uh, it's a, you introduce a personal story segment on attack journalism. This is a per personal to me because some writers are really violating every tenet of fairness in what they're saying in print about your humble servant. And then you say, I'll give you an example. Guy says about me a couple weeks ago, O'Reilly said he won a Peabody Award. Never said it. See, this is why you don't retract things because you just continue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You can't find a transcript where I said it. You, there is no one on earth you could bring in that would say I said it. Robert Reno on Newsday, a columnist, writes in his column, calls me a liar, all right? And it's totally fabricated. That's attack journalism. It's dishonest, it's disgusting, and it hurts reputations. Wolf, Wolf the media critic from the uh, New York Magazine, says it's also incorrect journalism if it's wrong. It's wrong. Okay, well, then the guy made a mistake. No, come on. He made a mistake. That lives forever in Nexus. <laughs> and he did write a column. Uh, and did he write a column the next day saying he made a mistake? Well, obviously, obviously you should. Usually I find if someone made a mistake, if you ask them to correct it, they do correct it. <laughs> Not in this society anymore. So, Bill, I'm sorry I call you one of the many people who do lie in my book. And uh, I guess we're going to have some question and answer, so you have a chance to respond to that. Answer, so you have a chance to respond to that. Uh, and there's others. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. And there are other, so many other people on the right who do it too, and they'll be enumerated in the book. And it's important. And it's really important. And it's important because we've been just taking it. We have been taking it and taking it on the left. You know, I went to that Wellstone Memorial. The next day I hear Rush Limbaugh on the radio going, there was no memorializing, my friends. They distorted that thing. I do a case study of that thing. They distorted that memorial so badly. And I, got, I'm, I wish Tucker were here today, because Tucker the next day said that uh, Republican senators who had come, who were friends of Wellstone, were shouted down with, by people, uh, by the crowd, when they, were try, when they were trying to speak, when they tried to speak. That, that wasn't the format of the memorial. There was lie after lie. Weekly Standard, Christopher Caldwell did the most vicious thing on that, on, on the Wellstone Memorial did not see it. All he saw, I think, were some clips on Fox that Mr. Hannity had put together. So I got, I got this chapter in verse, and I got it. And we're not going to sit for it anymore. We just aren't. OK, uh, I, I'll finish for now. I could go on all day. I know you could. And I know you, you just about have. Too. You just about have. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, you okay. tell him, Bill. We're supposed to be on here for 15 minutes. This idiot goes 35, okay? All he's got in six and a half years is that I misspoke, that I labeled a Polk Award a Peabody. He writes it in his book. He tries to make me out. No, 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 hey, no. That's shut not up. No, you, you had your 35 up. minutes. Shut up. This isn't this your This is show, what this guy Bill. does. Bill, this is you what can he tell does. Me. You can't tell. This is what well, he take does. Take control, Pat. Come on. I think, wait a minute. I think I need a whistle I mean, and a striped shirt. Sure. Yeah, I'm not I, to be a referee. Maybe I, I went on long because I got some I laughs, him to say, Can you please control him? This guy accuses I, I, me of being a liar, ladies and gentlemen, on national television.
because I misspoke and labeled a Peabody a poke. I didn't mention we won all four right. national headliners, okay? This is what this guy does. He demonizes it, all right? And then other people pick it up. Now, if it's important to you that I misspoke and labeled a Peabody you a poke, didn't just that's misspeak. fine. That's fine, okay? This is what he does. He's a vicious, and that is with a capital V, person who is blinded by ideology. And that's all I'll say about okay. everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. And I think what we need to do... I want to plant my opinion. ...is reclaim all of this. The one thing I want to say to the wonderful booksellers in this room, <laughs> if your customers tell you that there isn't a variety of books coming out this fall, <laughs> your customers aren't paying attention. Because I must say, I think we have shown here this tremendous range. And uh, I think one of the things that all of us stand for, booksellers and publishers very vigorously, is free speech and freedom of expression. And, and uh, I, I, I hope we don't take this personal, in, in, and I think at this point what we really need to do is find a way that we're going to have some questions and see if we can do this. So wish me right. luck, and if anybody does have a whistle and any of those signals for Pat, piling on or something, I'm ready. But Pat, can Molly, I just put in we'll a brief response to, to both speakers? Um, I just want to note that the Polk is an extremely prestigious journalism award. Uh, but that uh, my normal journalistic standards, you owed a correction on that one. Yeah, we did. Uh, by the way, the um, Polk, I'm sorry, Molly, but the Polk that they won was won a year after Bill left the, the show. The discussion was about the program. I said nothing that I want anything. It was a discussion on the program. Then why did you use the, the pronoun thank we? You. Thank Just, you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. I, I also wanted, wait a minute. Time out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, just to say a couple of other things, um, in our ongoing efforts to uh, achieve civil discourse, um, one of the things that I notice is that we do tend, and I know Bill specifically says he tries not to do this, but we do tend to m lump everybody, you know, the left, the right, and then accuse the left says this or that. And it's interesting to me because I, what I keep saying to people is, I ain't the left, I ain't populism, my name is Molly Ivins. Uh, and when I write about the issue of possibly no weapons of mass destruction, the first thing I note is I have no way in hell of knowing whether or not there are any WMDs over there. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to respond to is the idea that uh, Bill specifically said he wants there to be WMDs because it's important for the country. It would be a terrible loss of credibility if we don't find them, about which he's absolutely correct. Um, and there's a point I want to make about that because there's an implication that people who opposed this war uh, did so for any reason other than that we thought it would be terrible for the country. What I did before the war is predict a short, easy war and the peace from hell. And so far, I think I'm two for two. I didn't want us to go into Iraq, not because I didn't understand that Saddam Hussein was a miserable son of a bitch. I've been active in human rights work for 35 years. I knew he was a miserable son of a bitch when the Reagan administration was sending him weapons. Um, and I said from the beginning that you could make a case for going in on humanitarian grounds alone. But that's not the case the Bush administration made. And the only reason I oppose going in after him is because I was terribly afraid that this country would get caught in an awful quagmire over there. And the only reason I opposed it is because I love this country. Thank you. Bill, I would be interested in your and uh, Molly having a discussion about her concept of Doug Jones, because in a way, you're talking about who's looking out for you, so you're talking about a Doug Jones too. The difference between Ms. Ivins and myself is that I don't believe the government can uh, help you all that much in your life, all right? I, I don't believe that all of the big government programs 
um, that are set up to benefit the folks. Most of them never get to the folks. I was a high school teacher. I know where their money goes. It doesn't go to the kids. And you want more money? Fine. It ain't going to the kids. It's discipline. It's structure. It's uh, paying the teachers a better wage. It's training the teachers better. All of those things. So I see the world as uh, a world that self-reliance matters. That's what should be taught. All right. That's where I'm coming from. You know, we talk about the tax and the deficit. Well, you know, the left now is screaming the deficit, the deficit, the deficit. And I'm looking at them going, look, you guys were driving the big government programs ever since the Great Society of 1964. I mean, those were massive spending programs, many of which failed dismally. And the corruption it's here in California, for example, in the Medi-Cal program is astronomical. It's a giant waste. Safety net, yes. Nanny state, no. All right? And I'm, I don't believe in income redistribution. All right, I don't believe in taking money from me. All right, who started out? Oh no! Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Just, no, no, no. Started out with nothing. All right, and then giving to somebody else and not regulating what that person does with it. I, I just don't believe that. Now I respect other people who believe opposite from me, and I listen to them and evaluate their argument. But from my life's eye, I don't see that as being effective. I believe in drug testing for welfare. I believe in personal responsibility across the board. So that's where I'm coming from in the, in the uh, Dub Jones uh, argument, all right? I'm coming from this society needs to be trained in self-reliance and responsibility. Okay, I think that's a perfectly legitimate point of view and um, listen to it with great respect. Um, again, we have this problem though that my name is Molly Ivins. I never went around saying big government programs were wonderful. Um, I don't know who you think I am, but I'm not, you know, liberals. My name is Molly Ivins. Um, it says in the preamble of the Constitution that there are six purposes and functions of government. One is to improve the general welfare. I myself have always thought that meant he mostly health and education. Uh, and it seems to me we are still in this country not in doing a very good job on either one. And in fact, there is considerable evidence that the entire health care system is not just showing cracks, it is literally falling apart. I mean, the bricks are coming out of it. And what you will see after this round of state budget cuts, I have just finished covering the legislative a session in Texas, which of course involved being embedded with the troops in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, they cut nine billion dollars out of a budget that was never generous. Believe me, Texas state government is not some wasteful operation. Uh, and they cut it all out of programs that help poor people. Now, I'm fine with, uh, you know, open competition, but I'm a great believer in the equal starting line. I don't want equal results. I don't want everybody to end up in the same place in life. Those who work harder and are more talented, you all go on and soar. But I want an equal starting line. You're never going to have an equal starting line. You can work to get there. And, and I write about this in uh, Who's Looking Out for You. It's the first chapter. You will never have it because some kids have good parents and some kids have drug addicted parents and alcoholic parents because some kids are born with more gifts and some left less gifts. You will never have it. It's impossible for the yeah, government to Yeah, but why not keep it. working at it? You can work at it, but you have to work it, at it under a very disciplined structure. And I believe that. I believe that the government can provide that structure, but will not because we live in this age of political correctness that's just through the roof. But one of the interesting things about the dovetailer theory is that the middle class and working Americans get squeezed to death, and that's true. But why are they getting squeezed to death? Three reasons. Under President Clinton, Americans paid the highest taxes since World War II, state, local, and federal, all right? The tax burden on someone like me, all right, and migrant, went over 50% in New York State and in California as well. But the people who were making between fifty dollars and $80,000, their tax burden hovering around 40%. That's 40 cents on the dollar taken away from them. Yet real estate prices to buy a home in this state, in Southern California here, or in my state in New York, or Massachusetts, or Chicago, or anywhere where people cluster to make it, have at, gone right crazy so that the mortgage takes way more money than it took from my parents. And then the educational costs if you send your kids to college. The three combined just make 
the average American in debt. So I'm saying the more money that you have to control in your life, the better it is. And that the government had one of the Bush makes his mistake in the sense that he wants to t cut taxes, but he won't impose discipline on the Pentagon, for example, where one trillion dollars has been misappropriated, not stolen. They don't know where it is. There's a guy named David Walker. He's the head of the GAO. He's a really good guy. He's one of the best public servants in the United States of America. They call Walker in, and Ms. Schroeder knows this because she was on these committees. And the Pentagon cannot account right now for a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars. They don't know where it is. That's the fallacy of the Bush administration. They won't impose the discipline. So when the money is allotted to the education or the Pentagon or whatever it is, that it's run like a private company, that you have to go back to the stockholders and say, here's where the money went. Okay, wait a minute. I really have to jump in here. The idea that private corporations are more efficient than government is absolute crap. Well, that's the wrong way. Now we, now we part ways. Now we part ways. There is something that uh, economists are now studying, which is as a result of Enron, WorldCom, et cetera. It's called control fraud, when the fish rots from the head down, which is what happened at Enron. We have a whole chapter in our book about that. Um, the idea that a uh, government in the private, it, why do you think the Pentagon is so screwed up? It's all private defense contractors with endless cost overruns. It's the $700 hammer. Right, and it's nobody the imposes discipline says so don't do that. You can't do that. that you're absolutely right on that. Private defense that, contractors are pulling that shit off. That's not just in the defense industry. It's in the poverty industry. It's in the educational industry. It's across the board. Am I being punished? No. <laughs> no, no. I'm sorry. I want it. I wanted also to respond Forgive on the... On the me. I just thought we'd have a Doug Jones argument over okay, here. Okay, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the debate. I'm no, enjoying no, the debate, no. but I could actually participate in it. I, I, I wanted also to respond on the economic argument. Uh, I do believe in an income redistribution to this extent. If... Look at, look at this current tax situation. Fifty percent of the people in this country are now paying more in payroll taxes than they are in income taxes. That's eighty percent. Thank you. When the Bush administration discusses tax distribution, all they talk about is income tax. They right. totally misrepresent the actual tax burden on people in this country. Um, the, uh, we'll quote a guy named B. Rappaport, who's rather an unusual Texas millionaire, and what he says, if you're making $50,000 a year, you're paying $8,000 in income taxes. That ain't put you in the poorhouse, but it will sure as hell crump your, crimp your budget. I make a million dollars a year. I pay $400,000 in taxes. That leaves me with $600,000 to live on. You going to feel sorry for me? You deserve your money. You earned your money, all right? Now, you want to take money from people who have earned the money, all right? And you want to give it to other people. No, what you this is You cannot point to any constitutional provision. I don't want to give it to other that people. Says that, look, if you want a socialistic quasi-socialistic state. Let's have a referendum. I don't Let's vote give it to, on it. I don't but don't want take to give private it to property people. away from people okay. and give now, it to other now. people. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Al, this is it way over your head here. No, no. All right. Go back. Go back. We'll call you when we need you. Go back over there. Unlike, unlike Molly, I am a liberal. And, and the idea that government programs can't help people is ridiculous. And I, I'll, I'll give you a story. I mean, you, you like to say you came from the poorest background possible. You've said that. No, I haven't. I yes, said you I came have. From, from a working class Levittown background. You said background. from the. There's another distortion. Did you grow up in Westbury or Levittown? The Westbury section of Levittown, all right, which I've defined 87 times. Okay, it was on okay. the A and A bio. You know, we'll send it. By the way, I'm why not... don't you come over to my house? My mother lives there. Come on over. We'll have a bagel, all right? Okay, come great. on over. I would love that. Uh, hey. Mrs. O'Reilly would too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll give you an example though, um, and I, I don't think my wife will mind because I'm writing about it in the book. When my wife, should I move back to the thing? Is this, this is, this yeah, is yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was just trying to get in here. Be, th there are a couple things I, I can talk about. I mean, when, when you say I'm way, uh, this is above me, I remember being on your show and saying that in 93, Clinton 
had um, passed his Budget Deficit uh, Reduction Act without one Republican vote, and you said, Al, that's impossible. And I said, no, he did it without one Republican vote. And you didn't understand, I guess, at the time, that both houses were, were Democrat. And, and, and both, you know, uh, so this isn't way over my head, okay? Uh, we'll give you an honorary PhD, Al. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Anyway. Any questions so, out there? Any questions from the folks out here? Well, wait a minute. Know Are, did did um, Bill just cut me off? I, I, well, Al, you had, you had 45 minutes up here. Oh, Come no, on. No, 45. No, 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 no. At no, least seem that way. It always seems longer when none of us have the microphone, I know, but <laughs> it really wasn't. Uh, can, can I finish sure. just about my wife's story? When my wife was uh, uh, 18 months old, her, her father died in a car accident. Um, her mother was 27 with five kids, one younger than my, my wife. They made it scrape by. My, my mother-in-law didn't have an education. She worked in a grocery store uh, in the produce department. She made it barely scrape by because of Social Security from her, from her husband. They got the house on, on the, uh, the GI loan. Uh, they turned the phone off a lot. They turned the heat off a lot. They lived in Portland, Maine. But the government saved their ass. And this is, you know what, this is actually serious, this stuff. And the fact is, when Clinton, re you know, you may remember that in the 90s, during Clinton, we, he raised the top level. And it didn't stop people who were in the top 1% from working or producing jobs. He created 23 million jobs. And every Republican said that, that was going to cause a recession. And you remember, it didn't actually pass with any Republican votes. Not one. OK. Well, all right. So maybe, <laughs> let me say about all of this is this has been uh, the Last week was a very good week for me because as the author of the Family Medical Leave, the Supreme Court upheld it six to three with Rehnquist on my side. I never thought that would happen. So one of my great hopes for the planet is if we all keep talking together, maybe we'll figure this all out. And I think it is very difficult. It's a very difficult time, I think, for everybody to try and figure out what's going on. But I think it's only Not fair. That hard. <laughs> that Sorry. we open it up to uh, the audience because they may have some viewpoints out here. Do we have anybody who is not shy? There's someone over here in a gray suit. I feel like Adrian, you can always take on the uh, redistricting thing. Yeah. Uh, the question is the redistricting fight that drove the uh, Texas legislators to uh, seek refuge in Oklahoma, a great moment in the history of our state. Um, I've been covering the legislature for a long time, and I've seen some strange maps before. Um, I've seen districts that look like giant chickens and districts that look like coiled snakes. Uh, I remember one time during a redistricting fight, uh, an old boy named Guy Floyd stood up and said to the chairman, Delwyn Jones, Delwyn, look at here what you have done to my district. Got a great big old ball on one end and runs in a little bitty old strip for 300 miles. He's got a great big old ball on the other end. Now the courts say the districts have to be compact and contiguous. Is this your idea, compact and contiguous? Delwyn thought about it for a moment and said, well, in an artistic sense, it is. <laughs> and um, the map produced by Tom DeLay, uh, and that's exactly who produced it, uh, was artistic to the max. It was sort of in the Salvador Dali school <laughs> of art. Um, really a stunning piece uh, of work. Um, and I really do think that um, there are, I know it sounds picky and petty because the whole thing is ludicrous. It, nothing in Texas ever happens. I mean, serious stuff happens with very serious implications, but it always happens with this weird hitch in the get along. And you just have to accept that Texans are always going to, you know, be producing ridiculous goddamn stuff. I mean, it just always happens down there. Ann Richards says, you know, the price of gas in Texas has got so high, women who want to run over their husbands have to carpool now. <laughs> uh, but there is a very serious... 
point, not only do the Republicans have no right to come back and, re and ram a new redistricting map down anybody's throat at this point. I mean, listen, once a decade for this horror is enough. Um, and the second point is that during the search for the missing legislators, a truly epic effort, um, DeLay called the FAA and the Justice Department about trying to track them down, and apparently our state police uh, got the Department of Homeland Security, which is supposed to be tracking down terrorists, um, to uh, try and find one of the pl a plane that was involved. Well, you know, using government resources for partisan political purposes uh, is is really serious stuff. I mean, I realize it's a petty and absurd escapade, but that's really pretty serious stuff. Um, uh, and I just also wanted to say that, um, as far as we know, redistricting is now dead. Um, they may, um, unless they're forced into a special session, and at which point I think Governor Goodhair would put it back on. And let me say I call him good hair because Governor Perry has a head of hair that every Texan can be proud of regardless of party. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else have a question? There's one over here, this gentleman. Yeah, this is a question for Al Franken. Um, I heard a while back you were working with Anshell Media to try to get a liberal talk show format to counterbalance the controlling conservative talk show right. format in the corporately owned stations, which is even more important now because of the news with the corporations buying out multiple radio stations. Um, can you give us an update on those efforts? Yeah, uh, we're trying to get a uh, liberal or progressive uh, radio network together, and it's uh, I want to do it. And if we can get enough, I want to, if I fail, I want to fail big. So we want to try to get enough funding together to have a huge failure. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think there's an audience out there, and uh, I, I, I'm dying to do it. And the more I research this book, and the more I look at, and, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if I made this seem like the book's not, there's only one little chapter on Bill. But, but there are much more than the one. You'll really be interested in the book, Bill. But there's there's Bush stuff. I mean, there there's just um, you know just stuff that every day, uh, not every day, but Bush will show up at a children's hospital, say that this is so important what we're doing, and then the next day cut funding. Uh, and he does that over and over and over again. And there were so many lies in the 2000 campaign. Remember, this was the uh, gutted military. This was the hollowed out military. The military, when uh, Bush in his uh, uh, acceptance speech said, uh, if they were asked uh, to report, uh, two units of the, of the uh, army would have to say, ho two whole divisions would have to say, not ready for duty, sir. And of course, they were. And the, joint, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said they were. Not only that, but Richard Armitage, in testimony in the Armed Services Committee, a few days later said, well, yeah, they are. And I went up at the White House Correspondents' Dinner to uh, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, and I said, didn't the Clinton military do a great job in Iraq? And he said, F you. <laughs> and then we had a little argument. I think he was kidding on the square on the F you. I thought he was being funny, and I appreciated that. Um, but uh, Cheney said in 91, after the Gulf War, that any president fights with the military given to him by his predecessor. Come on. And he said the first call he made after the Gulf War was done was to President Reagan to thank him. So the point now, is so now that people lie in campaigns, is that the point? I'm shocked. I'm no, shocked. it's that they lie, lie when they're in office campaigns? and they continue to lie and that also that it doesn't get Dang. out. It doesn't, it isn't fair and balanced. It isn't? And what we want to do what I want to do is be able, I, I, you know what, I'll tell you what, I talk about firm balance. When you edit this together, I know you're going to show this for the, to the factor audience. Uh, can I be in the edit room with you to help, you know, kind of, because uh, I would, you know, look, I, would love, I would love the C-SPAN audience we to see We were doing a propaganda show, I'd put you in the editing room. You're a genius at that. You're, you're the best propagandist I've ever seen. But if you no, sit here, Sean Hannity even people who agree best. with you in this room, <laughs> Even people who agree with you in this room, okay, 
will, they can't possibly think that you're objective, that you're looking at life to be fair, to come to a fair conclusion. Sure, the Bush and Cheney people told lies, but Clinton Gore didn't tell any lies? Did you miss the Jim Lehrer interview, Al? Come on. Yeah, I think you, that if you I, make a nice I agree, living, you I make agree. a nice living being a propagandist, and more power to you. Now, but don't put yourself up as a truth teller because you're not. Well, here's the thing: is in the Bush, in, um, in, in the, in, yeah, I am though. I, that's the that's the difference between you and me. In the Rush Limbaugh is a big fat idiot. Yeah. And other observations. I wrote a book on Rush, and it was a way to get at the Gingrich uh, uh, right. And not one fact was challenged in that book. There was one. Nobody one era. read the book, Al. Nobody's going to challenge you. I don't read the book. Rush, Rush Limb is a big fat. Uh, it was I'm number pay one. Bucks to see that. Come on, you're preaching to the choir. That's no, what no, you no, do. No, 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 no. Even John Fund, the guy who um, ghost wrote Rush's first book, came to me and said, "You did a really good job." There was one fa one thing as I quoted a uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson study in my thing, which was in its preliminary uh, phase, and the findings of that changed after this thing came through. But I'm telling you, I have, uh, this thing is thoroughly researched, and I do tell the truth. And when I, and, and if I do get caught, or if I do say something wrong, I admit it. And the, the, the whole point of what I said here was that when you were caught, you Look, if Last this is all back. you got, we heard it, Al. If this I, is all you got after six and a half years, no, I told you it isn't you are all pathetic. I have. If this is all you got after six I, and a half years, I told you it isn't you all are I got. Pathetic. I it isn't all I got. Idea. I got a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's as I lame have, as that, it's I, unbelievable. I have a wonderful idea. I'm going to ask the if publishers of all three of these authors. To have a please party? send complimentary books to each author of all these. And I'd love I'd to. I'd gladly read Miss Ivan's book. I'd I, gladly I, I, read I, it. Well, no, but I think you ought to read all. I, uh, we'll have a little reading lesson here and see where we all come out at the end. Mm. Um, uh, do we have time for one more or not? One more, she says. Okay. Bill, I think it'll help sales if you talk shirt. about my book on your show. <laughs> Okay, you get the last question, you lucky <laughs> soul. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank all the speakers for a lively lunch. Um, yes. You, you know, it strikes me that this dialogue is good entertainment, but at another level, it actually is of some concern to me for our republic, and that is the difficulty of trying to get people to come together and have, a, have an effective discourse that really, as a result of the discourse, brings people together more than spreads them apart. And, and I would really like to hear a brief comment from each of you of what you think might be something constructive that you might do to help a discourse that could bring the differing views of this country together versus split them further apart. Um, I'll take that first. Um, I work with political humor a lot because I find that if you can get people to start by laughing about something, it sort of clears out the cobwebs in their mind uh, and um, they focus on whatever you have to say without the distraction of whatever it was they were thinking of before, which according to uh, studies of college students is sex in 95% of the cases. Um, I have worried about the poisoning of the well of uh, public discourse considerably myself. Uh, and to the extent that uh, I'm known as a mean writer, I just want to point out that <laughs> I only take shots at politicians. Uh, I realize they have wives and mothers, but no one ever held a gun to their heads and forced them to run for public office, and as far as I'm concerned, they are all in a free fire zone. Uh, no, civilians, I, I never bother with. Um, the meanness of political discussion 
today, I, there are lots of villains. I mean, it's not just Rush Limbaugh, and it's not just, uh, you know, whoever you want to name. There is a nastiness about it, and I was really appalled to see Grover Norquist, who's an uh, extremely well-known figure on the, on the right, uh, in the, what they call the movement, people who call themselves movement conservatives. And he said that their goal was to bring uh, Washington-level vituperation and partisanship to state houses around the country. Uh, they're saying is that bipartisanship is um, like being seduced. I mean, they have an ugly way of saying it. Um, and to find somebody actually saying, you know, we want more anger, we want more, you know, we hatred expressed. And when you talk to people who get so angry about politics that their faces turn red and their veins stand out on their necks and they shake their waddles like a turkey gobbler, they're just so angry about it. You know, you just want to go, most real politicians are far less passionate than that. Whenever you have money and power, you're going to have strife. And through the uh, years of our republic, we've always had very, very um, um, contentious debate in the political realm um, because power is um, a seducer. It's something that people will sell their souls for. So is money, so is sex. Um, so that people like me and Ms. Ivins, who uh, are new, basically news analysts, we analyze what happens. Um, and from my point of view, what I try to do is look out for you in the sense I try to look, this is the issue. Here's what I think about it, and here's how I've arrived at my conclusion. When I said in the beginning, I'm trying to convince you to think like me, but I'm trying to give you a, uh, a perspective that's clear. I can't bring people together. It's not my job. All right? It's not what I do. My job is, unfortunately, to rattle cages, to put the bad guys on alert that here we come, all right? and you better shape up. You better stop doing or start doing better. All right? So there's no way on earth that I can advance the cause of people coming together. But you need people like me. You need watchdogs. And one of the reasons the O'Reilly Factor has been successful in publishing on radio and on television is because we are not timid. For years, the network news, the standardized network news and CNN were too afraid to do what we do. Too afraid. There were no commentators on their, uh, they, they were aligned to Sunday morning. They wouldn't go after the sacred cows, both the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, they wouldn't even give voices to pro-life people um, unless they blew up an abortion clinic. All right. So it was a stranglehold. That's broken down now. It's broken down all across the board. There are as many left voices as right voices in the media. You can get NPR, you can get Rush Limbaugh, you can get what you want to get. But at my level, and I think Ms. Ivins is in print, pretty much does what I do, um, we have to make judgments, and these judgments are harsh, and these judgments have to be sold in a way that arouses people's ire, or things will never get better. So that's what I am. I'm a watchdog. Uh, a populist watchdog. I'm looking out, trying to make everybody's life better and give you ammunition where you can fight the charlatans, you can fight the people who are hurting you. Al. Um, I consider myself a, a, a nice guy. And um, I don't like vituperation, but I, I feel uh, sometimes, sometimes you have to stand up and fight. And I feel like there is, uh, I think one of the reasons that Fox beats CNN, for example, is that CNN tries to play things down the middle and there's a certain dullness to it. And there's a certain, you know, I mean, Roger Ailes uh, invented the whoosh. I think that was a big contribution to cable. And, uh, but I, I think that our voices are not heard. And I just, I just, uh, want and by the way there were you know there were pro-life voices on tv before remember ralph reed he used to get on tv every once in a while um i i just believe that it is uh it is time that uh those of us who are, who are liberal i'm i'm a dlc democrat but i, I and uh you know i paul wellstone was someone i i loved but he wasn't you know i disagreed with him a lot and I like bringing people together. And I have a lot of Republican friends. 
Uh, I do. No, really, honest. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I just think that um, I, I don't, I don't, I think what I do does civilize the discourse. Because I think you just have to call people on it and, and call people on their incivility. And if you know, if they know there are watchdogs out there who are saying, you can't say that, you can't get away with that. Al, excuse me, but I just, the no, title no. of your book is Liar, Liar, Big Liar, and you're advancing the cause of civility. Is that what I'm getting here? Well, first of all, oh that's not God. the title you know, of my book, but you came close. It's unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm glad you're all here to see it. Well, I, 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 I get to, anyway. Uh, you know, the thing is, Bill, if, you, if you, you kept saying the thing about that's all you got after six years, and then you complained about how long I went on. If you want me to go on for several hours, I can go into some other stuff. But the point is that I was trying to make is that there are people on the right, especially, who are so vituperative, who are, who are Grover Norquist, who, who said basically bipartisan, what, what Molly Ivins was about to say is that he said bipar bipartisanship is date rape. That's what he said. And I, I think that uh, there, there's a, a place for a, a voice. There, there are voices. Molly's one of them. Molly's a great one. But there, are, there is a place to call people on, on things. And that's, that's what I do. And I think that does increase civility. And the name of the book is not what you said, it's lies and the lying liars who tell them a fair and balanced look <laughs> at the right. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is time that we thank our authors, thank our audience, and life goes on.